Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, September 25th meeting of the Board of Selectmen. I call this meeting to order at 631. Next order of business is public comment. Yeah, might be somebody else walking in too. Uh, Mr. Calabar. Yes. I would like to uh, say that I appreciate deeply that we are having Java with Jim meetings and I, and that, that was a great experience that we had you know yesterday and I would hope that you know maybe some of the other boards within the town would have you know similar opportunities to talk to their chairpersons to share in an informal setting you know talk about topics that aren't strictly re, you know restricted to what's on the agenda for their meetings so that we can better get to know you know how those board members feel about topics uh, and again have it be not as formal and uh, I think that would allow everybody in the community to have a you know, better opportunity to get a better feel for how the people that they've elected really feel about issues in this town rather than just you know sitting here taking votes getting two to three minutes to you know say your thing so I applaud that effort Greatly, and we will uh, we'll uh, we'll do several th throughout the course of the year, and we'll do it at different times so that we can can uh, meet with uh, you know if people are working, we'll have some in the evening. Uh, certainly during the day uh, works well too, but we'll we'll try to make it available to everybody. So thank you for your feedback on that. Yeah, and and if you could, you know, let's expand. I mean, this was sponsored by the East Granby Senior you know, community, but I, you know, I, and it was on their website and I had a hard time finding the notice about the meeting. I, I think if you published it more broadly, uh, that you'd have more participants uh, to those meetings. And it was also on the, the town of East Granby. Uh, again, I had a hard time finding it. Uh, are you friends on the town of East Granby? What's that? It's a Facebook page that we rolled out three or four weeks ago, or two months ago actually. Uh, and it's uh, and I'm doing the plug because this is televised. Uh, the uh, it, so if you type in town of East Granby on Facebook, okay. the page comes up and you can follow it. And by following, so you it, can follow it. Yeah, absolutely, okay. you follow it. And, uh, and what would it be under? Town of East Granby on Facebook. It's the town's page that gets. Okay. Information. Well, I follow. It seems you need to subscribe to every board meeting hey, how are you? in order to get those alerts hey, how are you? so there's not one that was just you check and you know, all in for all of them okay well that, that's a separate issue when you come I'm just saying that would, that would be a good thing if you could just say send me all notices for all meetings you know whether whether or not they're board of finance board of education board of selectmen meet and greets you know just you know, opt me, op me in for all communications. The uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, informal meetings like that, you know, they 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 would be on you know the town Facebook page, uh, and you like you mentioned on the senior services because it's not an official meeting, so there's not an agenda or anything. It's just you know it's just an informal yeah. meeting. But certainly, yeah. uh, certainly, I've I've heard what you said. Okay, I'm just you know making a suggestion to make it easier for everybody that's interested because you want more participants I mean I'm hoping that's what you want the other thing is I noticed from the last uh, minutes from you from you folks that there's a 1.2 million dollar gap in the capital plan from the Board of Finance and I know that's on the agenda for tonight so I'm hoping that we'll hear some discussion about how that gap is going to be uh, closed and whether there's going to be a prioritization of items that are in the capital plan as far as since there is a gap as to far as what we can fund or if you're thinking that we're gonna you know do some you know increases in taxes or find some other way to find money to do those whether it's grants or whatever what what is the solution to cover that gap because it's a significant gap. It's a it's a significant gap over a five year period. 
uh, if the Board of Selectmen uh, decides it could use and get almost all the way there, if it uh, uses money previously allocated for roads and roofs in the five-year plan, since the roads and roofs are addressed with the bond plan. So that's one of the things that, that we would discuss. So that wouldn't be any increase in taxes. It would be utilizing the current dollars that were allocated in the five-year plan. So is there a list of what specifically are the items that are, are in this gap? Yes. There's a... You, can I get a copy? There's a, there's a five-year plan that we're working on. It's a draft plan right now. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, we we publish it after we we you know formally adopt it, and then take it to the board of finance. Okay, so, so when when will it be formally adopted? In well, uh, the next me our next meeting is the 9th of October. Uh, it depends on how much progress we make uh, tonight, uh, and then also the next meeting of the board of finance is October 22nd. I would imagine that we would have a plan to submit to the Board of Finance for their meeting on the 22nd. And, and are you asking for any community input on the priorities of, of those items that are in the gap? At this point, all the items that are in the gap are fire apparatus, and if you're looking back, you, you'll see that I invited the fire uh, chief uh, and, uh, and, uh, and... I'm all for public safety. He, uh, and I uh, invited uh, the fire department to come and thanks to Trevor Troy and Chief Flaherty uh, for coming. So we've, we've, we've worked on uh, the fire apparatus and the fire for, for a good long while, looking to see how we can work, work everything in. And back in October of 2018, the, um, what happened is the, we submitted with what the gaps were and the Board of Finance approved it with the gap saying, okay, it's not funded, but we're going to approve it this way. So then uh, uh, we worked with the fire department looking at sort of some used apparatus that we can, that we can use uh, instead of purchasing brand new and some other things that, that we're looking at. And, uh, and then with, in February with the approval of the uh, roof and, and uh, road bond, uh, on the five-year plan, it freed up a considerable amount of money that is within $100,000 of what the $1.2 million apparatus gap was. So again, we're going to take road funds and apply it to fire apparatus no, no, rather than what they're dedicated towards? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. It, I, because the it, with the bond, you don't need to have anything on the five-year plan for for roads because Except it's a paying it back. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of that, that's the discussion that we'll have. But it's a five it's a five year plan, um, so it's not a case of taking money from somewhere else to do something else. It's a case of putting it on, either removing it off the plan or putting other items on the plan. This happens with the five year plan all the time. It's a moving. Um, vehicle there's there's uh, there's a lot of input uh, what you start out with depends on what some of the needs are that that, that are surfaced and so it, it it is something that is you know it's a plan that is constantly under revision and changes and assessed i just want to say you've had a history i mean of taking money that is from road maintenance from the state, there are grants that are dedicated to those sources well, that's, that's and re reallocating them to other items. First of all, that, 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 hold on, let me talk, I Jim. I, I mean, well, it's you can respond, said, but I'm just saying you've had a history, history of doing this, of taking funds that are for road maintenance and other purposes and consciously reallocating them to other purposes. And we've had a $9 million bond that has now had to cover that that strategy of yours to take road maintenance funds and reallocate them to Chromebooks, uh, fire apparatus. Uh, that's not their purpose. The, uh, and this is my, my my personal opinion is that those funds should stay for what they were targeted for. And and if there are other 
you know, I, I support public safety. I absolutely support public safety. Well, you know, we, but but we grants and other mechanisms to fund these things are probably more in the best interest of people in the town rather than raising taxes, incurring indebtedness, and making it, you know, more, uh, for me, I'm a retiree, I'm on a fixed income, okay? So it, it directly impacts me. I'm not trying to be, you know, crabby about all this, but it seems to me that there are other venues or sources that could be explored rather than raiding these funds. Okay, so let me, let me you know, I, I think you probably said everything that you want to say. I did. Uh, the, um, and we certainly provide that opportunity. Um, the Board of Finance, not me, the Board of Finance uses the funds as to flow into the regular budget and they use that to fund the capital. But the Board of Finance was never told that that money was for road use. The board it comes to the Board of Selectmen and then you, Jim, ask the state to approve it for our I mean, yeah, we're going to have a, we're going to have a meeting, but the uh, I think we but it, listen to comments, but I think we're getting into. Uh, but anyways, let, let me just you know let me finish my thought. Uh, my thought is is first of all the uh, uh, it, it, the money can be used for other uses and they're approved by the state, so there's nothing underhanded or anything like that. I'm not saying that. Uh, it by it's uh, by OPM uh, and uh, it was uh, it's how the board of finance has funded the capital plan uh, and they looked at it twice in the last two years and they decided to continue doing it in that particular way and why the signature on the the waiver request absolutely absolutely okay. um, so anyway so yeah I mean hopefully that clears it up it's not a case of diverting funds it's it's alternative uses that were uh, were approved by the state very good thank you you're welcome and um, since we'll have uh, some discussion from the fire department, uh, unless you have any other public comment, um, uh, you, are I have no of, public comment you are part of the agenda. So. Be happy to get to the formal discussion. Okay, the uh, next uh, piece of, uh, on our agenda is the draft five-year capital plan. And uh, thank you to the fire department for coming uh, before us. Um, what I gave, put in your package is several items. Uh, and one is the uh, is the plan that's been presented to us before by the chief and the fire department. The next is the draft uh, plan uh, that's in there too. Uh, yeah, and then two sets of letters. Hopefully that didn't com confuse you. Basically, the the uh, the one to the uh, board of finance was similar to what the the board of selectmen discussion was on the meeting that you missed, John. Yeah. And uh, Chief, uh, the uh, have you got a format in mind, or would you like me to start to ask you questions? Yeah, no, please ask questions. I think that would okay. So uh, the items that target. the items that were uh, rec uh, were were on the original five-year request was uh, the uh, replacement of the utility six. And it, that actually was done with the utility truck, uh, so that need was met. You have Rescue 8, uh, which is at the time was 35 years of age. It's a little older now. And you, uh, on, the, uh, on the sheet in front of us, show $600,000, but uh, you had come back later with $200,000 that you thought you could get a good used vehicle for. Um, as I was looking at the plan, uh, I did not see $35,000, uh, uh, which was engine five, uh, and then it's a replace with engine two as the spare. So that's not on the plan, and I'm not sure I understand that, but we can get back to that. Sure. Um, just go back to engine five again for one second. I was looking at the paperwork. I apologize, I didn't hear what you said. So engine five uh, is showing a, a request of $35,000 to replace it with engine two as a, as a spare for to perform bodywork and electrical modifications. Uh, and I presume that would be on engine two? Yes, yes, yes. The, 
as you know, the plan, as it stands right now, we talked about putting some money into refurbishment of engine three because that engine's roughly 12, 13 years old. It's in that 10 to 15 year window. What we would like to do is not do any refurbishment on engine two because that's about what, 23 years old. Uh, that's beyond that window, but we would like to do some very basic uh, upgrades to that to keep that as a spare apparatus replacing uh, engine five. Engine five would be uh, taken out of service as a frontline pumper, which is our reserve pumper right now due to its age and really lack of capacity with water tank and uh, pump size. Okay. So uh, that uh, $35,000 is not on the five-year draft that I shared with you? Yes. Uh, and then uh, you also have a, a UTV uh, that, uh, why don't you uh, describe what you want to do with the UTV? Sure. Right now we don't have a vehicle that can go off-road to provide rescue services to injured hikers or bikers, which we had two occurrences this year. I think last year we had two occurrences and we don't have an off-road vehicle for uh, brush fires. So by purchasing the smaller vehicle, you know, quite a bit of cost savings over a conventional vehicle. Um, you know, we budgeted or asked for a placeholder of 25,000 to give us a off-road vehicle that has firefighting and rescue capabilities. And at a previous meeting, I shared that information with the board of select. Correct. And that, and also the other, uh, the, the other item that uh, you uh, would like to access uh, in the upcoming fall yes. which is the, um, the hydraulic tools or correct. The, the extrication, extrication tools. tools, correct. Uh, then uh, going on to page two of your, uh, of, of your presentation, uh, it would be $750,000 for a, a uh, to replace engine two, which, which is a rescue pumper. Um, and the, uh, the way we looked at that, uh, at least for the time being, was $375,000 in FY22, $375,000 in FY23, which would give us the $750,000. Are we able to, with $750,000, to get the vehicle that you need? Or I am requesting? As long as we keep in the time frame of those years, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, number. Okay. And then the refurbishment of which uh, um, the plan that we started to, to, to work on actually was pushed into the current fiscal year. Uh, that would be $150,000 to refurbish the uh, pumper and rescue pumper engine three. And the, the request for that would be $150,000. So what, what does that refurbishment do for us? The, what it would do is upgrade the lighting system. We would add safety features, you know, hopefully a complete uh, airbag system that none of our engines have at this time that come on uh, new equipment. We would reconfigure uh, some compartments, probably put a different uh, ground ladder actuation mechanism and go in and examine the, the main pumping uh, apparatus on that to make sure that it uh, is doesn't have any imminent uh, problems with it. It's past the annual pump test every year. It's just starting to show signs of wear. I think at this point it does make sense to get it into a shop and look at rebuilding the pump and packings on it. Does this buy us additional time? Uh, yeah, I look at this as, as you know, adding uh, another 10 years onto the, uh, onto the life of the apparatus. So, I mean, we, we have been using vehicles 30 to 40 years, so we would expect that we'd get the 30 to 40 years out of this. Yeah, I think, I think you know, a few things are going on. Um, we're responding certainly to more motor vehicle accidents. So these apparatus are used, perform two functions. They're bringing our rescue tools, Engine 3 is bringing our rescue tools to the scene of that accident. Plus we're using the firefighting equipment at the scene of the fire, the pumps engaged, 
in case you know there's a fire or spill that we have to use hose lines. And you know we're seeing a rise in those calls to rescues. Uh, certainly, uh, multiple vehicle accidents. We just had one again tonight up on North Main Street. I saw all the vehicles. I wasn't sure we were going to see you folks today. Yeah, no, I was able to get out of there in time. So. I am absolutely comfortable with saying we're taking a vehicle that has a lifetime of let's say 22 to 25 years and putting that 25 to 30 years and possibly even 35 years on that. Okay. Yeah. That's typically, typically, and, I, and we talked about this before, and I'm sorry to interrupt, uh -huh. that the refurbishment is done at 10 years so that it's at, you know, it's looked at at another 20 years at that 10 year point to guarantee 30 years of life. Okay, so we're, our thought process would be correct, correct on the 30 to 40 years. Yes. Okay. And then uh, there's, you've got rescue equipment uh, that uh, you discussed for $44,000 and that's the battery operated Hamatro tools. Um, and that's something that, uh, that, like I mentioned, we have uh, I've distributed at previous meetings to the board here. Uh, and you'd like to access that in the fall, so that would be something that after we get the five-year plan set, then we would also look to access the ATV and the um, the Hamatro equipment, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, that, that's correct. We had prioritized that, I think, Probably a year ago was our number one priority is replace our uh, rescue tools. Uh, most of those tools are at the very least probably 15 years old and some are, uh, I know some are in, in the 20 year old category. Right now we're faced with the situation that I have to replace the hydraulic hoses. Uh, it's what's called core technology is a hydraulic hose inside of a hydraulic hose. Um, and we were notified this year by the manufacturer that uh, we need to take that out of uh, service as soon as possible. It's at its uh, life expectancy now. And that will cost us uh, $2,000 just to, to do that. We've had some intermittent leaking with some of the other hydraulic tools that we've had service. So the life of those tools is starting to, uh, to catch up with us. Select and uh, Doreen saw a demonstration of the new portable tools and uh, was uh, very right. impressed. Yeah, it, it's for its instantaneous use. It's just like a battery operated drill at your house. You take it off the shelf, you press the button, and it works. Or the gas powered tools, we have a power unit, we have hoses, and then we have all these assorted tools that go with it. So we're going from maybe five to seven minutes to be able to operate these tools to immediate uh, operation. Plus they have the added strength as well. We're, exactly, thank you Joe for uh, bringing that up. They have the modern uh, technology for spreading and cutting capacity. The uh, lift bag and the uh, vehicle stabilization kit are not addressed in the capital plan. Didn't you say that the lift bags are part of the hundred fifty dollar refurbish hundred fifty thousand refurbishment, or is that a different set of? Lift no, bags? no, that would that is not included in that. That the hundred fifty is strictly the uh, ref, would be for the refurbishment of the apparatus. The the lift bag would be the only one that would qualify as capital, but right. And then uh, the self contained breathing apparatuses that we that we've dealt with. Uh, uh, in the plan already. Uh, you also mentioned that you've you know, submitted several grant applications, one for uh, the uh, lift bag uh, and for the stabilization kit, and one for the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, spare cylinders, and the units, I believe. Yeah, that's correct. We uh, submitted separate grants on those. Uh, in previous years, they had been uh, Denied. We're hoping this year to get the $241,000 uh, to replace our uh, breathing apparatus. As you know, all the bottles are at uh, their uh, terminal life uh, expectancy, so we have to replace those. And we, we addressed half of those bottles on, right. on the fire department's recommendation with capital from uh, that was approved last June. 
and then we would in this current year we replace the other ones. That's correct. Have you purchased the first batch already? I haven't. I'm just waiting to uh, within the next week or so we should hear about the grant. So I didn't want to make that purchase okay. um, until that uh, grant we get thumbs up or thumbs down. And uh, then on page three of your of your initial uh, presentation to us, uh, the training aspects were not uh, addressed. Correct. Now, uh, what was addressed that wasn't on uh, the uh, the initial presentation was twenty five thousand dollars was added for hose replacement. Correct. Uh, in the current fiscal year, and seventy five hundred dollars for appar uh, for apparatus ports on the apparatus. Correct. Terminals. Terminals. Yeah, terminals. Thank you. Correct. Uh, so uh, the way we, uh, you know, again, this is a very rough draft at this point, but in the current fiscal year, we would be looking uh, at $150,000 for the um, uh, rescue pumper engine three refurbishment, $41,000 for the uh, air pack for the air pack units uh, because if we don't get the grant, we would be doing three to five. Right. We recommended that we stagger that over. And, um, and then we have those in, uh, in the out years uh, uh, for $40,000 uh, if we needed to address them ourselves. Uh, then we've, uh, the air bottle replacement we talked about already, the um, extrication tools, we've talked about that, hose replacement, and the data uh, entry uh, ports. Uh, those were uh, the fire department uh, items that would be addressed uh, if uh, the Board of Selectmen thought to deal with that, with that way. And then in the f uh, upcoming fiscal year of FY21, there would be the air pack units, 21-22, would be the first payment on the uh, rescue pumper and $40,000 for the uh, air pack units. And then uh, the FY23 would be second payment on the um, uh, on the um, rescue pumper, and as you know, what we do is is we would access both in the same fiscal year. So in that particular case, it would be fiscal year July 1, 2023. Uh, we would we would be able to access those funds if the town supported it. There would also be forty thousand uh, dollars for the uh, air pack units, and and then FY 24 would be. Um, 200,000 for a used replacement for rescue eight and $45,000 for the air bottle, uh, air pack bottle replacement. So uh, after you uh, reviewed the draft plus uh, the conversation we've had, do you have uh, any other comments? Is this something that you think and the fire department folks that are with you uh, uh, that are on your apparatus com uh, committee and also uh, the assistant chief uh, do you uh, do you see this as helping uh, to solve what we need to solve in the upcoming five years for fire department needs? Yeah, absolutely, Trevor. Yeah, and I let them you know speak their mind. They're intimately involved in all this. Uh, certainly, Troy has been involved in the acquisition and replacement of this equipment, probably going back four years. So it's a continuation of a of you know requests for us um, I think that this is a plan that makes sense it spreads it out over time we're going to continue to apply for grants uh, we have in our operating budget money to hire a grant writer and we're going to continue and you to and I are going to be interviewing those that's folks correct soon. yes October 7th yeah I thought it was two uh, weeks yeah. so it unfortunately the grants are very competitive we had uh, bad news last month from DEEP, that small magic grant. We would put up 25, they would match that with 25. We probably got that for four or five consecutive years. At least, yeah. And because we had gotten it for four or five consecutive years, they took us out of this cycle for this year. So uh, they have a point system, so we maxed out on the point system. And we would use that $5,000 um, and this is hard to believe, but it's the absolute truth. Five thousand dollars buys two complete sets of firefighting gear, and that's 
what we had uh, intended the, the purchase of this. So, you know, we've identified probably three to five sources right now that we'd like to apply for grants, and that's our intention to, in the year uh, coming up, as the grant cycle opens up in the federal fiscal year coming, starting October 1st, we'll probably ask for grants in the area, I'm thinking, of four to $500,000. Well, we certainly appreciate all the time and effort that the fire department puts to uh, making the, uh, doing the research, the information, and making the presentations to us. Uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the amount of work that that goes into. Also, understanding that fire, uh, public safety, but specifically fire safety, is really important on two ways. One is we want to make sure our volunteer firefighters are safe, and we also want to make sure that they're able to have the tools to. Uh, protect uh, property and lives uh, for the town of East Grammy residents. So. Right, and we've been very fortunate over the past two months to probably increase our membership by five, five adult five, members and five or seven total. Yeah, yes. five or seven total, which is great. Yeah, yeah it's it's the, now the, the, very lucky. The, the, and, the, and that's terrific, uh, but. Uh, uh, and it is, no doubt about it. And the, the, uh, what I was going to just mention is that it takes probably a year for a firefighter to go through all the classes that they need to to get to Firefighter 1. Is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Firefighter 1 allows you to be inside the building and outside the building, not just a driver. Uh, so some of the folks that are volunteers and they're getting their experience and getting their training, uh, they won't actually hit online as a full-fledged firefighter until um, a year, year and a half. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely accurate. And as we had discussed, we are not responsible for the full cost of that firefighter training with the state because the state is no longer subsidizing that training as they had previously. And we, we certainly uh, appreciate the volunteers and we'll find the money for the training. So Thank you. Uh, as we did in the budget. Right, absolutely. In their operating budget. So. Sure, sure. Are we talking about just about firefighting? Equipment? Yeah, right now, and then we can move into okay. everything else. I mean, if we got a grant writer, I see one year we have a super high spike of 655. Yeah. I like to place a little bit of burden on the grant writer and maybe take a little bit off that 375 first year payment. And Try to alleviate that 655 spike there because it's like if he doesn't have a goal to work for, it's well, yeah, certainly something they, to right. shoot for. Uh, yeah. Right, I yeah. think when and I, I would think during our interview, that would be uh, part of a potential strategy. Looking well, yeah, our, our, our you know our strategy uh, at the interview is going to be, you know, what's your experience and you know and you know and what have you been able to do? Show us what you've been right. able to do, and then here's what we need. We need to have some you know, a million two worth of fire expenditures and we'd like to use as much grant money as possible and how are you going to help us get there? Correct. But on our plan, I like to try to plan for that. We have that one super huge spike that one year, 655. Everywhere else it's pretty close to what the Board of Finance requested. My ask is, let's go ahead and take a little off that 655 from that 375 and assume that the grant writer will earn his, his or her keep. When we were um, kids, they told us what happened when we assumed that they would be people well, would be able to do things. I, I understand your point. The, uh, the other part of it is that, um, you know, there's no way to really quantify it. Uh, and the, uh, there are some years where uh, we are, you know, I mean, the, the year before that, uh, FY21, uh, we're looking for 195,000 when the current five-year plan is 350,000. So, you know, you know, how do we level it out? And I think that's where you're going is how can we level it out and you know not use as I'm much time money? I'm looking to take money. the spike out. Yeah, we have one super huge spike that one year, and that would be a good place to assume we're going to get. Well, something. the other thing is that you know it, 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 the other way to smooth the spike out would be to take two hundred thousand dollars out of that year and throw it into FY21, but we'll, we can, you know, we'll certainly have that. Right. I think, you know, the five-year plan lays out the most immediate needs over a five-year period. You know, certainly we're willing to work with the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Board 
as John said, to do whatever makes the most sense at that time. Taking, you know, looking at the grants and the current grant guidance at that point in time on what we would apply for and reasonably think we have a chance to get. Because that's almost the year that, I'm not sure exactly what year, that the bond repayment starts. So that's when we see a huge spike in either a tax increase or we got to come up with cuts somewhere else. The, uh, let me just, yeah, I, it, uh, it, it might be 22, 23, John. But, it's but, it, but, but yeah, but there's, there's, there's the, you know, there, there's the temporary bonding, uh, the bond anticipation notes that are in the current year and then the following year, uh, we would anticipate that we would do that and then the following year to that would be when the full effect of the bond would hit mm -hmm. the bottom line. One other thing that I kind of want to talk about is the UTV. The one that you got here, it's like a super perfect one. Can't you see if you can find something that something that will just work? The, because I know you've had something else. It was way too big. Not right, practical. it was a unimod. Right. Yeah. Not practical. I, I think the thing, John, that we have to take into account is that the price of the, U, or the, price of the UTV is not $25,000. The price of the unimod is probably in the area of Thirteen thousand. Uh, the price of the UT of the UTV by itself is coming in around thirteen thousand. Yeah, and then the additional, the rescue, what I'll call a slip-on unit that affords us the brush fire fighting, wildland fire fighting equipment, and the rescue equipment is the other component. So it would be a, a tank of some sort. A tank, water. a hose yes. reel, a pump, and then next to that, an area to put a uh, person on a stretcher. Yep. So it'd be a skid unit. Um, kind of an L-shaped skid unit. The front of the skid unit would be anywhere from a 50 to a 75 gallon tank. Um, down the right side of the machine would be the uh, area for the Stokes basket. And then on top of the tank is the booster line. So that in itself, that skid unit by itself is about 7,000. So the, the roughly 55% of the cost is the vehicle to rush us to have the proper equipment for the usage. Yep. Right. And talking about that. And by the way, I you know I totally appreciate the fact that you got three different quotes and yep. looked at you, you you did a lot of research on that. And Trevor, I know that was a, a lot of that was your baby and, yep. and appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it would be purchased off state contract. Yes, it would be off state contract. Uh, just to uh, give a little bit of history, I've been involved in power sports for about 15 years now, so this is not like it's something new to me. Um, Polaris does have about 90% of the market for law enforcement, fire departments. They, they've got a huge market. And the reason behind it is Polaris, they are purpose built off road vehicles. Your Kubotas and your John Deere's, for lack of a better word, they're glorified lawnmower engines. They're not built for the stuff excuse me, that we would have to put it through. So that's why we opted to go for the Polaris. Okay. We're just saying that you know some people would see this as a luxury. I don't know if there's any way you can look at um, honestly a used unit or yeah. is there a one or two year unit you can try to at least show we're trying to save some money. I know on the uh, state bid spec sometimes you get a deal like you mm -hmm. know no person can walk in and buy the unit for that price. But right. I mean, have you looked at that option? Are, are there one or two year old units, three year old units? We, a lot of these I wouldn't think are used much. Well, they're for that one specific time when. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, really I think the issue becomes that we've talked about is if you look at a vehicle that's already been used as an off-road vehicle, what's the downside of that for potential repairs that we wouldn't know about? So certainly we would look at that, but I think we'd have to look at the use of that vehicle before we made a commitment. So would we look at something good use? Yeah, I think we would be, uh, you know, receptive to do that. Or a, de or a be, demo, uh, uh, you know, perhaps a demo. Yeah, and, and we've bought demo equipment, our rescue pumps, our hydraulic pumps now for our Hamatro equipment, and we have bought those as demo units. So certainly there's a difference between buying a used one versus a demo unit. Certainly a demo unit has probably been at some shows and, and whatnot. It doesn't have uh, a lot of off-road uh, time on it. Yeah, I mean, yeah I have some questions. Carrie, it, it seems like in almost all of your calls these days, 
you're participating with other fire departments. Correct. And even in the demonstration you gave that evening, the, the Air National Guard was there and participated and equipment was used from both organizations. How often is that? I mean, is that kind of now the routine where you're participating with other departments? It, it, it is, especially in the rescue situations, because as we talked about, when we have these serious head-on accidents and we have people pinned by the dashboard, as we've talked about, our long ramp, that long ramp, when filled with hydraulic fluid, takes the capacity of one power unit. So when we have to do that, and we're only moving one side of the dashboard when we do that, and we only have one long ramp, we're depending upon the air guard to use their ram, which is an electric power unit, or calling Lost Acres, or you know, Suffield, Windsor Locks, whatever the next closest fire department is. And for the most part, it works out. The only downside of that is the 15 minute delay that it takes for them to get there. Because we're asking volunteer fire departments from other communities to respond to uh, our needs. Now, in this ask for this apparatus and equipment, you're taking that into consideration. And so well, you're, not, correct. you're not asking for us to have everything. You're asking us to have what we need to have right. here, taking into consideration the time, uh, the nature of the calls, and so on, and also taking into account what is available in surrounding towns. That's correct. We, I think if we wanted to have the luxury items all the rescue, I think our capital request would have been in the area of $100,000. We're asking for equipment that we routinely use. You know, we, we asked for the airbag replacement. Those airbags were purchased in 1999. You know, as you know, we used those last summer in a rescue of a woman on South Main Street with a wall fell on. Um, we can use the airbags to spread and lift at motor vehicle accidents. Doesn't happen that often, but these are all pieces of equipment that we routinely use. The cutters and spreaders are literally used every single time at every motor vehicle extrication. When we have to get into people pinned by the dashboard, which literally happens every time now in a head-on head -on accident, then we have to utilize the ramps. And because we only have that one long ramp, we're depending upon the response from our neighbor, neighboring fire departments to come with that other long ramp. Okay, so all that's taken into consideration yeah, absolutely. in this. Um, and I think that's important to realize because we're not just trying to outfit East Granby, we're trying to make sure we have what we need Correct. in keeping with what surrounding towns would bring to the scene as well. Correct. Now the other side, and this is important for me to, to keep sight of, is you don't get many do-overs in this. No. So if you're looking at a piece of equipment, it has to perform, it has Correct. to work. Right. If it doesn't, it's not like, you know, you can turn around and go back. Right. Something's happening there. Time is of the essence. Right. So that's also being taken into consideration. The, you know, for 40 years in EMS and hospitals, they've talked about the golden hour. So we're always trying to extricate patients and get them to the hospital emergency room for definitive treatment in less than an hour. Last year, we had the accident on Newgate Road. The young girl took us over one hour to extricate her. Luckily, she survived. We just had the accident on Route 20, August 16th. Um, two people severely trapped. It took us 47 minutes to extricate one patient. And I think the thing that we have to, and we've been lucky, and I'm and I hesitant to talk about this, but if we have patients trapped in two different vehicles, you've got to remember that the equipment that we currently have, the configuration, is used on one car. So we're going to have to depend on another fire department to duplicate the equipment that we have to do that same extrication in the other vehicle. So it's not that, you know, we have the ability to treat, do extrications at multiple and multiple vehicles simultaneously. We don't. We only have the equipment to 
gain entrance and lift the dashboard and remove a patient in one vehicle. Because you gotta remember, once we put that equipment into play and utilize that, especially the RAMs, that RAM has to stay in place until that patient's removed because that's what's holding, you know, pushing the car apart for us to gain entry. You mentioned that you've added five or so people to the department. Where does that place you in terms of where you feel you want to be or need to be? We're in sheer numbers, I'm happy where we are. But here's the dilemma. It probably takes a firefighter here, once they go through Firefighter One and Hazmat certification and some of the you know specialty rescue training, it probably takes three to five years before that firefighter um, has enough experience and competency to be able to operate that equipment with very minor uh, supervision. The, the motor vehicle accidents are becoming very dynamic as we've talked about because of the specialty steels, the boron metals. It's very, very strong metal, almost impossible to cut with the current equipment that we have today. So we're nibbling and spreading and it takes, it's like training a mechanic, you know, a kid can go to technical school and learn it, but how many years doing the actual job does it take before that person's a master technician? Now when I was watching that demonstration, I may be wrong, but it appeared to me that perhaps that was also a little bit of training. There's no question about that. And in looking at the equipment, it seemed to me that somebody who was newer at that would have had a much easier time using the battery powered equipment, not needing to worry about setting up the um, generator, running all the cables, right. and everything else at that point. You're absolutely right. So looking at this equipment, is not only important in terms of saving lives and, and making sure you have what you need, but also allowing the firefighters to do what they need to do because if they have the right equipment, they have a better shot at succeeding. If they don't, it looked like you could have gotten into some problems there very quickly, um, especially with newer people or if they were the only ones who were able to make the scene. Correct. At that point. The setup time for the current gas powered hydraulic equipment. Like I said, it's five to seven minutes for experienced people. Um, and at those critical times, we don't put inexperienced people in those positions because we need to make sure everything's connected, providing starts, the everything's people there. Correct. Right. So um, it's, it's very labor intensive. And it take, like I said, it takes a new person a period of time, probably three to five years before they have level experience and competency to perform the basic tasks. Would you keep the uh, current hydraulic equipment as a backup or as a- I would, like, I would like to keep the newest power unit that we have in that equipment. Just like I said, Jim, for the simple reason with the equipment that we would want to buy, that would give us the additional long ram that we need to uh, roll the dashboard. So we'd have one hydraulic and one battery operator. So conceivably you could do two vehicles at the same time? Certainly two vehicles at the same time and certainly be able to, to roll a dash in one vehicle by ourselves without the aid of another fire department for their long ram. So does this mean you need the additional 2000 for the hoses? No, because what I want to do is, you have to remember, John, I have two power units and two sets of hoses. So one of the power units and one of the sets of hoses we would uh, no longer need. So, you know, that's why my desire, you know, the priority is the rescue equipment because I've got to replace that hose if I don't get the money. And I prefer to, you know, not to do that to get the newer uh, uh, electric power equipment. I'm all set. Thank you. All set. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Curie Flurry. Good information, thank you. And thanks for all you do. Really thank you, I appreciate your time and all your support. And
I uh, you know, understand that this equipment is very, very expensive, but it does have a long lifespan, and uh, you know we take uh, very, very good uh, care of it. That's why it's lasted as long as it has. And you know, as we go forward on October seventh, and we we uh, end up retaining someone as a grant writer, uh, and the purpose is for them to have speciality, as their speciality is to be right. in fire apparatus. Uh, we, uh, you know, we can perhaps take some of the spike that uh, that uh, Schlecker Museum sure. was talking about. So, very good. Thank no you. further questions. No further questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate, I appreciate it. it. I appreciate the public comment. Uh, Thank you. All this also. Thank you. So, the uh, getting back to the rest of the five-year plan, the roads and roofs have been removed from the five-year plan. Uh, due to the infrastructure needs being met through the bonding project. Uh, some of the out years are less than the Board of Finance five-year plan. It uh, was approved in October 2018 to help offset some of the heavier years, which contain the fire apparatus uh, costs. I uh, use as an example, uh, we go from 486000 to 195 to 655 to 545 to 460 to 430. And, uh, you know, uh, that question was asked of the Board of Finance, uh, uh, you know, at least to give them food for thought to see how they, they'd want to address with those things. The draft five-year plan uh, in FY20 includes $85,000 for the public safety roof that was not used, and the Board of Finance was asked to carry it over into uh, FY20. Isn't that, um, isn't that basically double dipping? Because that's paid for by the bonding plan. We're still using that. Well, the $85,000 that was left on the table uh, would uh, be would be re uh, would be allocated, not reallocated, would be allocated to uh, to fire safety. Uh, and during the budgeting process, uh, the chief uh, identified the the hose replacement of the data ports. Uh, FY21 uh, engine three refurbishment is moved uh, to FY20. Uh, we're seeing heavy use of the uh, police cruisers at this point. We have uh, four frontline vehicles, and they're getting used more as we have full staffing. Uh, and the um, private uh, or road job cars uh, that we purchased uh, for a song and a dance uh, from uh, other uh, departments are showing the wear and tear, and they do not have the new state police compatible radios. So they're appropriate for road jobs, but not for patrols. Uh, and then last on, the, on that year is the uh, is a strictly a placeholder for uh, re starting to look at replacing the accounting and payroll uh, software. Hopefully that's something we can do as a shared service with the Board of Ed. Uh, okay, going back to fiscal year 20, you're sure. talking about police cruisers. Like every time I drive by, there's four vehicles parked. They're not being used. I mean, the others are being used. Yeah, we have a full gauntlet of officers now, but there's always the same amount of officers on the road, even if we had fewer officers, more of them were just working more overtime. So well, the, it's not like there's additional cruiser use. Well, the uh, the four frontline vehicles are getting used more. For a reason. Because we got full staffing. I mean, you, you know. We've you, always had, I mean, we've never had full staffing, but we've always had the right amount of troopers on the road well, you know, but, with overtime. With overtime. So, an overtime person versus a regular person doesn't well, the hours, have a need the hours for extra. Are the hours, is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah, okay. It doesn't have a need for extra. Then, well, that, that certainly, uh, that, that certainly uh, is a valid point. Uh, the uh, flip side of that is three of the vehicles that you see are the private job vehicles. Right. And those, uh, those aren't appropriate for patrol use. Right. So, I don't see any reason why those can't be used for the private jobs. Well, they are. They are used for the they are used for, for the private jobs, but the you know with uh, more con uh, more consistent coverage, not depending on overtime, we're uh, you know and I understand your point, but we're seeing more usage of, of the vehicles, the uh, frontline vehicles, although we're trying with the trooper to make sure that we're rotating the use of them. Uh, let's see, FY twenty one the. Uh, uh, is showing an underspend of $155,000 uh, because it's moving into other years. Uh, the minibus would be increased. Uh, uh, the placeholder number was 
45,000 and we're looking at probably 60,000. So the, uh, in FY21, the minibus replacement, of which we'll look for a grant for the minibus replacement too to, to assist us. But at this point, we're looking at 60,000. FY22, uh, the uh, just changed the way the cruiser uh, reallocation was. Uh, FY23 uh, is unbalanced by $70,000, uh, which reflects, I th is that the spike you were talking about? No, that's no, a year that's after the that's spike. That's the following year spike. Yeah. We have more than one spike. I'm just looking at the biggest the spike. The biggest spike, yeah. And, uh, and then FY24, is underspent by ten thousand dollars and i remind everybody that the five-year bond project ends uh december of 2023 probably uh the first half of fy24 so in fy25 which would start july 1 of 2024 we uh it includes two hundred thousand dollars for road maintenance so that we consistently are maintaining roads with the chip seal or the crack seal or whatever else we need and uh, so that basically gets the budget close to uh, uh, what the anticipated budget of 2680000 over the five-year period. Uh, and the preliminary draft request was two point, call it $2.8 or about $100,000 different. The other thing that I note is as we transition to our new building man uh, management model, we'll do more assessments of the schools and there might be things that might come from the school side that we don't anticipate at this point. Uh, uh, and um, the, uh, I also mentioned, uh, which I mentioned already, that the ATV and the hydraulic tools, uh, the fire department is requesting those in the current fiscal year, uh, preferably uh, in the fall. I'd like to see that 91.5, which is our over budget, taken out somewhere in the way of either grant, anticipated grants, or something to clean it up. I mean, the best place to take it out would be that super high spike here, 655. I think, uh, certainly, uh, I think that our expectation is what we would be able to do that. Okay, well, I think that's what we should present to the Board of Finance. Okay. Does that would be just right to talk about. And there's one other thing I think we might have forgotten about after you're done. Sure. And what's that, John? Um, we talked about the Southeast Fire Station. Uh, we're putting on a new roof, putting in new ventilation. Uh, we found out that we have inadequate ventilation there. Do you think? insulating that would be a capital project or would it be something cheap enough that it wouldn't hit that threshold or should we add that to i don't have the answer for that now i will get the answer for that to see what the cost would be uh, but that's something that's going to need to be done prior to the first heavy winter i mean we're getting the roof done right now it might even be finished roof, is, they were uh, roof is, uh, is finished okay yeah. so the next thing would be the oh, ventilation sorry. once the ventilation is wide open now we have a freezing issue there so we need to hand, we need to do something basically this fall. I don't know if that can how we can fit that in. Well, uh, let's uh, let's find out what we need to do and what the cost would be, and then we'll figure out how to fit it in. And one other thing is, uh, I see that there's a new utility van. How is that paid for? I don't see it on the capital plan, or it wasn't talked about. Yeah, that's uh, that's the, that's a used vehicle that we were able to pick out of, up out of operating. Well, that was less than five thousand. It was more than five thousand dollars, but it was something we could purchase with operating, which so we did. It doesn't go to town meeting. It's it's over five thousand. Isn't it supposed to go to town meeting, or at least have the board of selectmen talk about it. In this particular case, it was an opportunistic uh, buy at the end of the fiscal year. Point point take. I mean, how much was spent on that? I don't have the I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. But I'll get it for you. But it's like, you know, none of the other boards can just go out and buy something that big that it was, without you know, it was even a, talking about it. It was an opportunistic buy. It was taken out of operating point well I mean, it, it is a nice vehicle. I thought it was new, obviously, but still. It was it was a good buy. Good. Okay. I mean, the, the dollar amounts that we're asking for are high, you know. 
It's like we have a lot of tax foreclosure sales going on. People are just really stretched thin. We need to try to squeeze these numbers as best as we can so that people can afford to live in their house. I mean, people are actually getting thrown out of their homes for not being able to afford their taxes. So it's up to us to try to figure out a way to make it affordable for everyone. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we uh, certainly don't disagree with that comment, and we certainly, first of all, it's not a lot of people, but one person is too many. Uh, and second of all, we certainly uh, do what we can to squeeze the dollars and make sure that uh, we're spending what is absolutely necessary. We certainly, uh, that's the whole purpose of these discussions, is to continue to have uh, a, a discussion. And that's the first thing in my mind. Every time we look at these, do we really need it? Are we doing this the best way? I never once uh, don't think about that. I pay taxes. I'm retired. Oh, you know, think so about I think about that all the time. And, and I also think about the fact that we need to have what we need to have, especially when it comes to public safety. So you know, you're looking at both sides here, but never for one minute do I not think about the cost and the affordability and everything else. But think about the person that's no longer able to live in their home anymore. But think it's about the just person been pushed who, too far. But think about the person whose home is on fire. Think about the person who's in the accident out in the middle of the road. You can't just think about that. You've got to look at the whole picture, John. Right. That's why we need to look at the whole budget. If we're going to have a high cost for capital, maybe we should start looking at our operating budget to smooth things out. Like, look, we found I don't know how many thousands of dollars to buy an opportunistic vehicle. So, well, you know, that's again, everything. Excess cash. Every, you know, John, we did the same thing with the entrance to the dump. You know, we decided to pay that because it was an opportunist, opportunistic uh, situation, and all three of us voted for that. Right. That was how much? But that was part of the bonding the project. Yeah, well, Jim has a dollar amount. You know, but we decided to do it. So, I mean, it was what, 25, 30,000? 40. Yeah, and we decided to do that. Now, you know, we did that knowingly. So you can't just look at one thing and say, okay, we're going to do it here. We made a decision on that. You made the same decision we did. Well, it's because I was told we no longer have shavings, and it was going to cost right. pretty close to the same That's amount, right. or just double the cost of shavings. And well, I mean, it, being, it, it was the right decision. It was, yeah. I, and I don't disagree. I, I just want to make it clear that every time we look at something, you're always looking at both sides here, and you're trying to balance it. It's not an easy thing to do. But you can't just look at the person like you're saying, and you know, getting thrown out of their home. You've got to think of the person in the accident on the street. You've got to think of the person whose house is on fire. You've got to think of the situation where safety is an issue. Somebody's breaking into a house, and you've got to have a cruiser that takes the police officer there. You have those. Well, that's what we're trying to ensure, John. But we're all looking at that from the same point of view. Yeah, I, 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 I think all three of us have the same perspective regarding, uh, not, you know, that it's uh, taxpayer dollars and that we certainly try to uh, spend them the best uh, possible exactly. way that we can do that. Exactly. That's why we have discussions like this. Uh, certainly, I think we could, uh, you know, the next version of this will reflect uh, the out of balance, 91,000. Uh, it will uh, reflect perhaps uh, what we may be able to, to think about from an anticipated uh, grant perspective, knowing that you know when we do the five-year plan and if we're three or four years out, that that may change if we're not as successful as we, we want to be. But we certainly can take a look at these things and incorporate them in the plan. I think that makes sense. I, know. I just see you know we're constantly reallocating funds. It's like, what if the town roads and roofs project didn't pass? It's like all of a sudden we found all this money. And instantly it's spent, it's gone, and then some. It's, and I certainly understand what you're saying. My flip side of that would be that uh, we uh, identified for the Board of Finance a million two deficit uh, that, uh, on, on funding the fire apparatus. So the, you know, that, that would have continued to have surfaced. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not, you know, hey, if it's found money, let's spend it. It's, an underfunded need that they never addressed last year that uh, this you know, this draft is starting to address and how it comes out will depend on, on how it is that, that we at future meetings decide we want to go forward. So. 
Okay. It's a difficult conversation, and, and I certainly, as you do, and Joe, we certainly understand uh, taxpayer dollars. Which is why we returned $142,000 in this year's budget. Uh, let's see. Moving into correspondence. Oops. God, I almost did what I. Did you do bury it? No, didn't do it yet. <laughs> didn't do it yet. Okay, uh, the agenda item correspondence. Uh, there's the Thrilla on the Hilla, uh, which is a fundraiser that the uh, faculty at the high school plays the students, and it's a basketball game, and then usually the place is sold out, and they're trying to raise more money. Uh, uh, old guys like uh, Joe and I uh, can't uh, can't play basketball anymore at a competitive level, John. I don't well, know if I you still do. <laughs> Uh, reason why I bring it up is they 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 are making it open to more people of the community. I certainly uh, will participate from the fact that I'll I'll certainly make a, a donation and go there and maybe I can be the assistant coach or something of of, uh, of the teachers uh, or something like that. Just wanted to give a little uh, shout out uh, to uh, the public regarding uh, this. It's going to be November 22nd at the main gym at the high school at 7 p.m. Uh, and for the past four years at the high school, they've had a faculty versus student uh, basketball game, uh, and they've called it the Thrilla on the Hill. Uh, so uh, they're looking for uh, more people with different coaches and park and rec people and members of the community. So there you go. So I certainly will do everything I can to support that. So am I. Uh, the, uh, uh, I got a year-to-date report from the Ambulance Association uh, they have been 300, uh, through September 19th, there was 364 calls for the ambulance in East Granby. 74% of those resulted in transports. 26 were not transported. Those are refusals, cancellation, lift assist, or uh, unfortunately uh, deceased on scene. Uh, they've done stop the bleed training uh, for 40 citizens, uh, school personnel, and all town employees. Uh, they've been trying to do CPR training and they haven't had a lot of success with that. Uh, no response to the training dates. They're looking at alternative ways to do that. Uh, the Stop the Bleed kits have been placed in municipal buildings uh, and uh, as you leave this room, you look to the right, you can see that the kit was set up. Uh, those were all donated by a resident of East Granby to the town and also to uh, the school. In question the CPR, no response. Uh, does that mean if there were not enough volunteers or they couldn't uh, set up the class? Or plenty of volunteers, nobody to do the... Uh, no nobody, trainer? Plenty of trainers. Oh. Uh, no volunteers to take the course. Oh, okay. Uh, October, I'm sorry. That's weird. Oh. Yeah. I think that people would want one. Yeah, yeah. October 1st, uh, uh, 10 a.m. Uh, at the Center for Contemporary Culture is another meeting on the 2020 census with uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Beisowitz and Congressman Larson. Uh, they, uh, Connecticut receives $10.7 billion a year in federal funding, which averages $2,900 per person. So they, they want to make sure that everybody is counted uh, so that uh, in federal grants, uh, Connecticut gets its due share. Um, but we gave you some information uh, regarding uh, the uh, 100 years of suffrage uh, for the women's vote, that's in 2020. Uh, we don't have a committee as of yet, we can use some volunteers, so I'll put that in Let's Talk Turkey for October also. Uh, but right now, uh, we don't have, uh, we don't, uh, they're looking to do all sorts of uh, events throughout the state. And uh, one of the things I want to do, at least, is to put together an East Grandy committee. I uh, got an unsigned letter, but it was uh, regarding uh, a, uh, dirt bikes uh, on uh, public road, particularly down in the Spoonville area. Uh, I gave it to the resident trooper. Uh, the, uh, also included the 
year-end financial from the treasurer and uh, yeah, not, not any surprises there. And uh, towns in the black by quite a bit, right? By quite a bit. By quite a bit. Uh, town uh, was uh, uh, three hundred thousand dollars over revenue. Um, collection rate was uh, almost ninety-nine percent. We budget ninety-eight percent. Uh, for taxes, but uh, the interest was uh, uh, $73,000 was budgeted and $162,000 was received in interest as the interest rates went up compared to what the original budget was set. And a couple other uh, building permits uh, uh, where uh, $140,000 was received, uh, the budget was $62,000 and the conveyance tax uh, which reflects uh, real estate uh, was um, uh, 130% over budget with 104,000 versus 80,000. So, from this BOE number here, is this still being reconciled? Correct. The BOE number is still, uh, well, that that's the number they have. It's a different process with the reconciliation. This is the number that our treasurer has. Correct. This is the number our treasurer has. Uh, got a resident that sent an email about. Uh, work that was going to be done on Copper Hill Road. They, she was concerned because her house is a historic house seven feet from the road. Uh, and went out uh, and spoke with the woman and with uh, DPW and uh, the, the curbing that is going to be addressed uh, and drainage that's going to be done in front of her property and on other sides is not going to bring anything closer to her property. So it'll have no effect. She was very happy that uh, I actually brought the town engineer with me, and uh, she was very happy with the results and uh, was complimentary of the response. I also noticed on Newgate, that stone wall looks like they're going to be able to work around that. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be able to work around that, that wall. Uh, it uh, took a long, hard look at it, and uh, uh, it, uh, it appears that that stone wall will not need to be moved. That's good, because it looks good. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a great amenity. Uh, in case anybody wants to go to uh, an open house uh, that uh, I've been invited to, uh, it's uh, we have a hemp farm in East Granby, and uh, she's having a uh, harvest festival on September 28th. Uh, her uh, her farm is at uh, 102 North Main Street uh, in East Granby. So. Okay, I'm going back to the. Uh Copper Hill Road. When is that going to be paved? It's not this year, right? No, it's, that's just oh, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although, I mean, they're, they're, you know, when you're walking, we did some, you'll remember, we did some emergency repairs three or four years ago on the, on the side, and that's what we're trying to do now is the drainage so that we're able to uh, prevent further erosion uh, like, like it happened when the road blew out. Uh, we, the only thing that we're paving this year now, in addition to the four miles we've already done, is the two and a half miles of Newgate, and we're only going to we're going to do drainage, put the binder coat down, uh -huh. go through the winter, and then put the crown coat, final coat on. Now, are they going all the way to Suffield, or are they stopping at the stop sign? Stopping at the stop sign. Uh, and the rest of it's we're, yeah, going to be left or yeah, top coated or uh, the, looked at later. You looked at later. Um, let's see, uh, met with the Connecticut uh, Air National Guard, uh, Colonel uh, Walnut Drive, uh, one of the things at our hearing when we were speaking about the reallocation of Walnut Drive that's being paid for by the Air National Guard is there was some concern about maybe some screening could happen. Uh, so I talked to uh, Colonel Glenn from the Air National Guard and he uh, is uh, going to put mitigation on the list of things that they're going to use uh, uh, some bond money for inside the gate. So they'll do the inside the gate, and then we'll see if they can do anything outside the gate. Outside the gate would be uh, some sort of mitigation. You know, about a week or so ago, I was driving down Route 20, and the public notice for the town hearing was still up there. Are they taking that down? That, that was removed uh, earlier this week, okay. and it is down. I remember it when I drive by. I was going to call you, but I always forget by the time we get home. Well, don't don't call me with your driving. Okay. <laughs> uh, additional correspondence uh, is Halloween at Old Newgate. Uh, so that's going to be October 12th and the 19th from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. 
it's geared uh, towards adults, uh, and it's uh, uh, the Cambridge Brew House is making a Newgate beer that is being donated. The profits uh, will, or the proceeds, will go to the Friends of Newgate for the work that they do. Um, and uh, they've, they've uh, I addressed, I attached uh, how the. Uh, it's going to work, and they're going to have uh, bracelets that will have a tab on it for one beer. If you don't have a tab on your wrist bracelet, you don't get a beer. I didn't see that. Is that mm -hmm. oh, I didn't, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the additional. Oh, maybe it didn't, didn't, maybe it didn't go. Yeah. But we did talk a little bit about okay. it the last year. Was that just put in this afternoon? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the impression. And uh, also, uh, in the additional... Uh, I, if you go, John, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to buy him fifteen dollars for the entry and five dollars for the beer. So he's a twenty-dollar date. Wow. The uh, uh, additional correspondence also includes a copy of the finished ballot uh, okay. for the upcoming we'll take a look at it there. Uh, Next order on the agenda is the minutes from September 11th. John, you weren't able to attend that right. meeting. And I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Right. Unanimous on our part, and then an abstention by John. Uh, let's see, tax incentives. Uh, we're we're uh, getting close to starting to work on that, but we're still have that tabled. Town building committee update. Uh, the uh, Middle school, high school roof is completely ripped, uh, with about 60% of the uh, of the cap put down. That was as of last week, so it's um, further ahead of that. They're doing off-hour work, uh, three o'clock on, with with uh, spotlights and that sort of stuff. Uh, the uh, all grove is two or three Saturdays. We'll finish the uh, the liquid and the stone. Uh, so that'll happen uh, in the next within the next couple of weeks, weather permitting. So I would think mid-October, all grove will be a completely done. Uh, middle school, high school, by the end of October, uh, should be done. Uh, the uh, once the cap is there, they can start doing the metal. They've ordered the metal work, so we're doing that. Also, as I also mentioned, we are uh, we have a. Uh, uh, We've done four miles plus of roads, plus the uh, new gate that we're going to do. And uh, so far, we've spent four million, uh, and this is an additional two ton. We spent four million six hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars, of which a million five for the town roads. We anticipate uh, we started with a two million dollar budget for the first year, so that uh, is where we're going to come in at. Uh, the roofs uh, through. Um, uh, the last, not last week's building committee, but prior to that, uh, the total town roofs would be paid 122000 on roughly $380,000 worth of roofs. In the middle school and high school, we've paid $2 million, uh, and what we will uh, we'll end up paying the full $4 million plus of all the roofs and then apply for reimbursement from the state. Uh, and we're getting at a point where we uh, should be able to apply for the state uh, sometime in October. So this year spent is going to be about $4 million, yeah. is that what you're saying? And how much was the on anticipation note that we got? Just over that? It was uh, $6 million because you, okay. had, you had to bond them. You had to bond, you know, we expect to get $1.5 roughly, $1.5 million back from the state, but you got to pay the bills prior to that, so we bonded the whole the okay, temporary So we're bond. expecting six. Point something million dollars worth of bills before the end of the year, right? But we're not going to have six million dollars. Yes, the short answer is yes. Okay, I think I understand you. Yeah. So we had to bond the total amount, even though we're going to put back a million five that we're going to get from the state. Right. So if the net to us is going to be four and a half. But short answer in is essence, we have we'll have extra money sitting in cool. our account for next year's road work project. But we're also going to get another bond. We're going to do a, do another bond anticipation note of just buying the short term money. Right. Okay. Uh, stop sign on Spoonville. Uh, no new information until October 9th. I have started to get some data uh, 
from uh, the officer on that and some additional information from the town attorney. Uh, next order is new business, which is tax refunds. Uh, and um, the, there are three refunds. Uh, they're all motor vehicles. They've all been uh, countersigned, even though you don't see it. The original is, it shows a countersign by the assessor. Uh, and it's for $69.60. $85.61 and $247.96. Make a motion to approve those. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And we've got three transactions for appointments. And uh, one is to uh, Steve Orlowski works days now, so he uh, isn't available for the commission, uh, the Youth Services Commission. So we would remove Officer Orlowski, replace him with Officer Menard, and then reappoint uh, Russ Houghton uh, to the Inland and Wetlands Commission. I think you should probably reword it as not remove, but accept his resignation. I don't think he's asking to be removed. And no, thank him for his service. Uh, it, we, we, we certainly accept his resignation and thank him for his service. Right. So I'll make a motion to accept Steve's resignation and add Scott. Is it Maynard? Menard. 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 To the Commission on Youth Services. Uh, yeah, on um, Youth Services. And you know we can do all. If you want, we can do all. Okay, what's the other one? Russ Houghton uh, to reappoint Russ to the Inlands and Wetlands Commission. I'll make the motion too. I didn't see that. So much. I didn't get that until. Okay, so that's. I, I, I didn't. I didn't get that one until about four fifteen from the call. So. Okay, so uh, it's been uh, made and seconded. And all those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Okay. We got one more with Joe on there. The uh, uh, we didn't we don't need to approve Joe because we already did that, but I did need to swear him in. And I oh, okay, that's why. Because okay. I, I remember doing that. I thought maybe it was just coming up for another reappointment. Okay. And Our next order of business is to go into executive session. However, no votes will be taken. Uh, certainly, since we have some public uh, here, we can, uh, if uh, the census of the board, which I think it is, is why don't we see if there's any uh, public comment, and then we can move into executive session. Otherwise, you guys would be bored just sitting here. Yeah, we, <laughs> it, it, would be, it would be empty. Uh, Mr. No, Calabon. No so on the... Uh, Spoonville stop sign. I, um, I would like to see the the board have the resident trooper who is most familiar with this topic be the one that is going to be at this October 9th meeting. It seems that we have an interim uh, position right now. I'm not sure how familiar he is with what's what the issues are on that particular he, uh, situation it just if i if i may uh, uh, the, uh, he is an 18 year resident trooper who spent 15 years in and about this town knows the town very very well uh the uh the original trooper that made the uh the recommendation is uh, in southeast asia he uh, in the process of going to southeast asia he was deployed uh so uh the uh the uh his replacement uh, had a uh, an injury that he sustained uh, at work, but not here. Uh, and so, uh, the best person to make the presentation, and I've invited him already. Invited him tonight, but we didn't have the all the data that we needed. He will be at our meeting. He will be. And so, <clears throat> you've collected the data. We we've, we've got more information that we're looking to get, but we started to collect the data. We've got thirty six. So will that days. data be published before the next meeting, or will it be presented at that meeting? The uh, it will uh, the data probably will be presented at that meeting. We'll do it in a summary fashion. We'll have a summary page that kind of shows what the you know, the time frame is, 
what the miles per hour is, what the volume is. I mean, roughly a thousand people go back and forth on that road every day. Uh, and uh, if they're going toward, preliminary information indicates that if they're going towards Route 187, they're going slightly faster than if they were going towards Seymour. Uh, and uh, downhill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, so anyways so we will have the the data uh, we will have summary sheets that would be available for any resident that that attends the meeting, uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, discuss uh, the all the data information and information from the town attorney on what the options the board of select would have. Because it seems that that road is is not truly a residential area road, is more of a cut through road, especially with all the people that work in that area that are down by Route 20. So so it is a high traffic road. Um, I don't think there's going to be anything that we could do that's going to change that situation. But I was wondering if, you know, besides stop signs, which are not really meant to be speed controls, um, whether we've looked at speed bumps, uh, I know that putting sidewalks in there would be an expensive option, but given you know safety concerns of the people that I'm hearing from that area, it seems like that would be a, a, a much better permanent solution uh, to what's going on on Spoonville Road than erecting more stop signs and other things where we have to focus more of our police effort to patrol that area. Because uh, the, the people there seem to want to be able to walk their dogs and ride bikes with their kids, and, and I get that. I mean, um, and really, you know, so it, it's the, the planning probably sh could have been done better at some point in time, um, but unfortunately, we're stuck with that situation there. And I just think that you know, putting another stop sign. Is is not the solution. It's it's got to be something, something better than that. Uh, and I applaud the efforts of you know, East Grand PD for going. To, I heard you know at our meeting yesterday you said they issued 40 tickets, including UPS drivers and FedEx drivers and whatever. But those folks are going to continue to exhibit that behavior because, you know, that's you know they have to do their job. They're on a time schedule. You know, so uh, I, I'm looking for something more permanent, you know, solution for that area rather than something temporary that we know may not be as effective. So if at this meeting on the 9th, if we could get some numbers as to, you know, what, what would it cost to put in sidewalks on Spoonville or what would it cost to put in speed, speed bumps periodically, because I see those. They worked well in Phoenix where I was a resident. For, for streets that weren't meant to be cut-throughs, but turned into cut-throughs just because of where businesses were. And, and they were very effective. And you know, speed bumps are not that expensive. I understand sidewalks are quite a bit more expensive, but, well, it may, but, but, it, but yeah, in the end- Thank, thank it, you for your comment. I'm just saying in the end, you know, I think a more permanent solution would make everybody more happy than just putting in another stop sign. I was, I was the one that was kind of opposed to stop signs only because that's not their purpose. I was not opposed to any other forms of speed control. But we haven't even talked about any other right. forms of speed I, control. Yeah, I, I think that should be part of the discussion. The I think the cost should be put out there. Um, you know, we're probably and, and until and until the situation in, improves, I would continue the special enforcement of that area right. for the UPS and the FedEx drivers or whoever else. And eventually, either their companies are going to fire those people, all right, or be more responsible about their driving in that area. So uh, I would create a special enforcement zone and, and make it two months. And have them focus on it, and and by golly, as soon as they start paying enough money, they're going to start paying attention. Well, the uh, first of all, the uh, thank you for your comments, and and just let me mention a couple things. Uh, one is is it uh, you know it would be several hundred thousand dollars for sidewalks. 
uh, in, in the area. But if one kid gets killed, but, but, but uh, hundred thousand dollars is not a big deal. I mean, but back it, to what Joe was saying about taking the whole thing into the big picture situation is they've got a situation there. People aren't happy with it. Yeah, it might be a little bit. I just heard we're going to save one point something million dollars on our capital plan for road improvements. Heck. Hundred thousand dollars. Let's go put some sidewalks on Spoonville. Well, first of all, this is a point counterpoint. Right. Okay. Uh, second of all, because uh, I you know, very nicely listened to what you had to say, and I thank you for your comments. Uh, the uh, looking at the cost of sidewalks would be several hundred thousand dollars, uh, and we've already talked about some of the needs that we have for capital. The other thing uh, is that. Uh, you know, st speed bumps aren't necessarily the uh, the optimum solution to this. We certainly uh, will take a look at, at how appropriate options. We will have a little discussion on speed bumps, but there uh, the there are some times when uh, stop signs can be a relatively easy way to handle some things that aren't just speed related. It could be congestion related. Last thing that I would say is that uh, back of the envelope, 80% uh, of the tickets are going to residents of the neighborhood. 40% uh, of the town lives off of the Spoonville Road, at Seymour and Spoonville Road, uh, and 80% uh, are going to residents. Just uh, one other quick thing, and that is, for everyone who is in favor of one thing, there's another person who's not in favor of that. So these are not things that you can just do on the basis of public opinion. I think we need to look at this from what's going to work, what's going to solve the problems. And then the other point is, while we're talking about Spoonville, the same case can be made for virtually every town, every road in town. And as I'm walking around, um, it's not just Spoonville that you hear this on, it's all the roads. And uh, everybody's looking for some way and as you said, Jim, um, in many cases, people are pointing at the FedEx, the new Amazon drivers, and everything else. But I can just speak for my own neighborhood. It's a lot of people who live in the neighborhood, and sometimes it's me. <laughs> and sometimes it's me. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Marks. Yes, hi. Good, good evening. Good evening. Oh, good evening. <laughs> um, I, I live right off of Spoonville, too. So I was just going to say, all of everybody makes sense. It's, you know, I see people roll right through, and I've probably not stopped to a full stop myself, but um, it might not be right to make a decision on one evening, and maybe there's more data that could be collected trying to see what other towns are doing. I just saw Unionville. I mean, everybody is the same everywhere, so it's, it's everywhere. Um, so maybe there's other data studies, whatever, that can be brought to the table um, before making a quick decision on the stop. I just don't know if a stop sign is going to work, but if you say that it's could. Well, we, we, the, the, uh, thank you for your comments. The enforcement uh, is uh, raised sensitivity uh, and will continue to raise sensitivity, uh, but eventually, uh, you know, they move on to other areas and then we'll come back. Uh, uh, so, you know, a, you know, whether the stop sign is the right solution or the wrong solution, it could be a temporary solution. Speed bumps, uh, depend, you know, temporary speed bumps uh, cost about uh, $10,000 each. Uh, so, you know, you know that, that could be an, an option. Uh, there are cut through uh, traffic uh, uh, during specific hours, you know, as you would expect, change of shift. Uh, what we're seeing is folks are going from 187 to Spoonville to Seymour and then to Route 20, you know, and, and yeah. so, or they're using Miller uh, or uh, Stark Drive, but Miller into the back of Windsor. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, whatever the fix is, is, you know, it, you know is going to not going to be perfect. Uh, but uh, we certainly will consider it at our next meeting. And thank you for your Maybe feedback. Maybe something like no cut through, like a sign, no cut through. Sure. The, uh, it's hard to, to legislate no cut through. Uh, we uh, did, uh, we, we were very responsive to 
uh, Spoonville getting DOT to allow us to put the you know, through sign there because trucks were using it uh, as a cut through in a highly residential area. Um, so we were able to do that, but no cut through. Uh, it, it, I mean, the GPS sites, you know, you, you know, I mean, you go out of some of the distribution centers in Windsor and it says, ignore your GPS, take a left. I, mean, yeah. so. I just know, one, one small comment, we tried slower in speeds there in the past by putting up two stop signs. We still have the issue, so I think we need to look at all the options. We do. Uh, we certainly need to look at all the options, and, and I agree with that. The other thing that the data is showing us uh, is 80, uh, the initial data, and it, it may change when we get a longer picture, but the initial data is saying that 85% of the people going towards Seymour are going, the average, the average of the 85% of the people is 32 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone, and the people going towards Spoonville is showing the average of uh, 33 miles an hour. So that's 85% of the people are going 32 or 33 miles or less. Uh, and that's what the data, the initial data is starting to show us. What everybody, uh, and if I lived there, I would be the same way. What everybody is looking at is the, not the 85%, right. they're looking at the 15%. Or maybe and the top 5% when the guy just pulls through. And, uh, you know, there was, uh, there was uh, one direction, there was a high of 60 miles an hour, and another direction, there was a high of 70 miles an hour, but it wasn't enough to change the average or even give us a count, so it was a one of sort of thing. Uh, but that's the one that you remember, right. uh, is the one that, you know, we buy at, at yeah, 70 miles an hour. And, uh, but, you know, John remembers because we looked at this uh, three or four years ago, and the data showed us that it's about the speeds were about the same as they were then. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, you put up a stop sign, that's a legal notice, same as the speed limit. They're not going to obey the speed limit. What makes you think they're going to stop? Okay, so we'll look at all of those. And thank, thank you, you for your comments. Thank you for your thank comments. Thank you. Motion to go to the regular session. That's our cue. Second. That's <laughs> our cue. What, what, are we, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, the uh, police uh, negotiations and Ball potential Ball. litigation. Ball. Okay. And that's at 807. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. No, motion, no votes will be taken.